Okay, thank you so much for joining us. So we're going to be talking about developing a research protocol. This is um, one of our present one of our webinar series. This slide shows our um, framework for the research um, life cycle. And last uh, webinar, we talked about framing a research question and how important that was um, for starting um, a research project, really coming um, along with trying to get a really good research question um, developed prior to moving further with um, anything else in the research um, protocol development. And today we're going to talk about the next step, which is developing the research protocol. So the research protocol or study plan really is what falls between developing that research question and then actually carrying out your research study. And the message that we were really trying to get across at the last webinar was just how important that research question is as it really frames the design of your um, study. And um, that research question is going to be incredibly critical for developing the details of your study plan and your protocol. And what I've always recommended is that once the research question is developed, um, that the next step is looking at what kind of design, study design, that would lead to. Burhan will be talking about some of those study designs. And then once you know what kind of study design that research question would need, you'll be able to do a sample size calculation because the design of the study will determine what formula you need for your sample size. And then you'll, ha you'll have an idea about how many subjects you'll need for the study. And you'll be able to look at feasibility and see, well, is that going to be reasonable to be able to recruit that many patients um, in the time frame? Would I have enough funding in this particular grant source to be able to carry out this study with this many people and in the timeline that I would be allowed um, for this grant? And once you see that all of those things work, that the study question um, works with the study design and that the number of subjects is going to be um, something that I can feasibly do with recruitment, funding, timeline, um, then is the time to write your research protocol. So as we keep saying over and over again that it's the question um, that's really what determines the research architecture, strategy, and tactics. So we're going to start by going over some of the common study designs, which are really, of course, as I said, driven by your research question. And then we'll talk about the protocols that would be writ written after the design is determined. Thank you, Dr. Miranda. So um, <coughs> keep in mind, this is uh, an overview. So um, and uh, so we'll, we'll just be briefly uh, discussing about the common, the common approach in terms of clinic, uh, from a perspective of uh, clinical uh, um, research. So uh, in general, uh, epidemiologic studies are actually uh, broadly divided into uh, uh, two major um, categories, observational and experimental, based on where, whether or not the experiment that the investigator is manipulating uh, interventions or, uh, or um, exposures. Um, so in terms of hierarchy of um, evidence, as you know, the highest level of evidence is like a meta-analysis, which actually a meta-analysis of a clinical trial. So the clinical trial is um, the classic example of uh, um, design and study in terms of um, reaching to a very valid uh, conclusion. Uh, because in most like, you know, study design, what we're trying to look at is uh, the association between uh, an exposure and an outcome, sometimes also called predictor and outcome. So we're trying to see that uh, a specific um, factor is actually leading into, um, uh, into causation of uh, an outcome. Uh, so the other designs are actually flavor, a flavor of um, um, the uh, trying to actually emulate uh, a, rand uh, a randomized control trial. But in common practice, uh, you may find like you know the observational studies are actually dominating because of uh, feasibility, like Dr. Yolanda was talking about. So there is actually we have to always have a balance between validity and uh, feasibility. 
but validity should not be compromised because at the end of the day, the conclusion is to say like, you know, there is actually a real association uh, in a, a population. So uh, ha uh, having said like, you know, when you see the categories, you may have uh, said, okay, how about the other study designs? Of course, these are not the only study designs. So we are, we're not spending a lot of time on uh, qualitative study design, but we will actually give some overview. Uh, to whenever you want to do like, you know, again, a deeper understanding uh, about a specific issue, like a specific research question, let's say, for example, patient experiences, you may not get um, that perspective from doing a survey, like, you know, sampling a large number of people. If you are actually have a sample of 1000 people, you will not get like, you know, very detailed information. So um, this kinds of uh, research questions may be amenable to a qualitative study designs. Um, um, there could also be like you know, a first step in designing actually a very um, valid uh, instrument, survey instrument. So uh, they are actually also um, helpful in that. In, in terms of um, types, so the commonest ones that people actually mention are like the in-depth interviews and focus group discussions. Um, qualitative study designs can be done solely, uh, like you know, it could be like a standalone study, uh, but it could also be part of um, uh, a mixed method design combined when you combine them uh, with uh, quantitative study design. So, but our focus would be on quantitative study designs and specifically on analytic study designs. Uh, like you say, like, uh, most we're actually starting um, uh, from uh, experimental study designs. Uh, there are different types of them, but um, like you know, the commonest in published studies actually a randomized control trial. So to just give you some orientation, uh, when we're actually trying to do a study, uh, that specific question is um, uh, trying to make a conclusion or an inference about a population. So this circle is about the population. But to do that, um, in the ideal setting, if you're a guard, like you know, you know everything, you have actually enumerated everything. So you actually do not need a sample. But we're humans, so uh, and we're actually limited by time and money, so we can only uh, um, we can use a sample that is representative. When we talk about representative, it is not representative in terms of demographic characteristics, but in terms of the distribution of factors. So, so an investigator would use, so I'm dwelling a little bit time here because this framework is going to be existing for the other designs as well. So we're making inferences based on the, like, you know, a sample. So. What the investigator would do is um, um, they measure the predictor, so uh, based on inclusion and exclusion criteria that Yolanda will um, uh, talk about, um, what the, the investigator uh, would do is uh, randomize. So the R is actually randomize uh, uh, individual subjects uh, into um, the exposed and exposed group or the intervention and the placebo group. So there is, this is actually time zero. And then over time, like, you know, people are actually followed over time to measure the outcome. So at the end, so in a simple, like a randomized control trial where you actually have two levels of intervention, uh, like, you know, in the intervention and control, like, you know, placebo and a specific drug, for example, you're actually comparing the outcome between the two groups. And the conclusion is saying that, you know, all things being equal, um, the intervention is actually the one that actually is resulting in the outcome. Uh, so this, uh, this study design is very ideal in that you actually avoid one of the common, like, you know, flaws of study designs, which is confounding uh, because of um, different factors. So, this is very critical, so we may not spend a lot of time on the other study design. So, because the randomization is actually trying to take care of uh, uh, the making sure every factor between the two groups is similar except the intervention. Uh, to give an example from family planning, and uh, uh, one may ask, they want to determine. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the, 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 the efficacy, so this is actually an efficacy trial so, um, in terms of LARC uptake. So the outcome you're looking at is LARC uptake, and you want to compare uh, this the intervention of a computerized education model that you think is going to be helpful, and you're actually comparing it, comparing it uh, 
with an existing standard uh, brochure that people have, like you know, women would have, like in the waiting room. So of course, uh, for that kind of study, like you know, you're not gonna be like you know, randomizing women. I mean, they may be randomizing um, centers. You may be randomizing centers, uh, like waiting rooms. So, um, and then um, uh, another study, like you know, which is very classical, is um, in terms of medications. So the therapeutic trial is actually one of the things. So in abortion care, for example, if you are, want to determine uh, uh, the efficacy of pain, like pain management or abortion care, uh, and then you want to compare paracetamol block uh, versus um, paracetamol, acetaminophen, uh, you can do, uh, after randomizing, you can actually do uh, such a study. So this is the, the classic kind of design that we have. Um, but um, so we'll go over a couple of the other, like, you know, so we have the experimental design on hand. Now we are looking at uh, observational study designs, court, case control, and cross-sectional. As I said before, in terms of concept, it's actually like, you know, the court study design is similar to a randomized control trial, except in one respect, and that is the absence of R, randomization. So, so, um, there is an exposure that actually has already it's already happened like you know, if you're not talking about like smoking for example the uh, example is like you know smoking instances people who are smoking now and then smokers you're following them over time over time and then you're measuring outcomes so here the same thing the same schema so you're measuring predictors uh at the like at baseline and then over time uh you're following them and then you measure outcome and then uh, uh, you're trying to um, make a conclusion about the association between that predictor. They say, like, you know, if it was smoking status, whether smoking cancer, like, you know, is actually associated with uh, lung cancer here. So that that is the design we're looking at. Uh, an, an example is uh, um, if you have, for example, an a priori hypothesis that uh, there, there are like specific factors that are actually about a specific uh, family planning that actually predicts uh, continuation, like you know, uh, um, meaning like women actually are staying on the same uh, contraceptive. You can actually like you know uh, look at those factors. They say maybe different demographic characteristic and follow them over time, and you can actually measure um, the outcome of um, uh, using uh, still using. Uh, the the contraceptive method mix. Like say, if this is the outcome here uh, at that time. So you'll be able to compare between the two groups. Uh, the one we talked about. So it comes in different flavors. Uh, the one we talked about is the classic one, which is very easy to understand conceptually. Is a prospective one, and then there is a retrospective uh, design. Um, the reason I'm actually dwelling a little bit time about terminology is there is classically people think like you know case control studies are um, uh, retrospective studies and course uh, that like you know there are like you know it's uh, uh, if you actually like you know further define it there are different types so here uh, when you start at time zero here the present you already have the outcomes uh, developed. So if it, so for example, um, in this case, um, uh, they already have developed the outcomes. And then what you're doing is you're looking back in time uh, at, uh, and then measuring predictors here. So when we say this, like, you know, you're actually assuming that these measurements are already taken care, like, you know, are already done. These measurements are already done in the past. So nowadays, thanks to electronic uh, medical record data and administrative databases, we can actually have like you know this idea of a cohort uh, by definition. So uh, so can, somebody can start today, and if they want to investigate, um, uh, let's say uh, like a specific cancer, they can actually go back and see their charts. If they had like you know if they had like you know the hypothesis was this specific drug is associated with. This, 
a specific lung, uh, like cancer, they can go back and see uh, in their charts or even in the administrative databases if they, those individuals have taken those drugs. Um, uh, in the arena of family planning and CAG, uh, an example is uh, you, if you want to determine the two year uh, LARC um, continuation rate among a quart of women in Rwanda, uh, uh, a retrospective cohort design using a national uh, insurance database or even a, a claim, like you know, an insurance database with clearly defined exclusion criteria can help investigate the rate. Actually, this example, I should have pulled it up, is actually an example not from uh, Rwanda, but uh, from, I think, um, Denmark. So, I, so, which actually is using like, you know, a, a, a national uh, database. So, probably I'll try to send that uh, article. Um, the next one we'll talk about is a case control study. So I'll make a disclaimer. This is the hardest kind of study design. That is actually my opinion. In terms of um, uh, con um, uh, concept, it is very easy to co to do, relatively efficient, um, and seems very sexy, but uh, it's actually very risky because the most important thing is about, as we'll talk about, is actually what are the controls you're looking for. So in order to orient you, what is happening is everything is like, you know, you're in the present, you're looking like, you know, you're taking a sample of cases. Cases are the ones who have the disease. And then you try to find, uh, I like, you know, um, want to qualify. You want to find an appropriate control. So you actually confirm the case status, meaning whether they have the disease or not. So it's, for example, if it's endometrial cancer, you're starting with endometrial cancer. And then you actually find people who don't have endometrial cancer, but they have to be appropriate. That is the most important consideration in designing a case control study. And then after that, what you do try to do is similar to the retrospective court, uh, retrospective court design, you want to go back in time and see the exposure status or the risk factors or the predictors. Uh, sometimes you can find like you know samples already collected, so you can also do analysis of like, you know, uh, 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 those samples. Uh, so one, one thing is uh, I want to mention before we go is um, um, I have to like, you know, say like explicitly, the general goal in a case control study is to sample control from the population who would have become cases in the study if they had developed the disease. So that is the most important consideration. But a very, like, you know, as simple as the statement is, very difficult to think about. Because, like, you know, you would have to think about the source population where the kids are coming from. So a classic uh, bias is using pop, uh, hospital controls. So I, I'll give an example. So what happened was um, they were looking at uh, lung cancer and they were looking at um, uh, so they wanted to do the association between, let's say, um, association between um, smoking and uh, pancreatic cancer. And it happens that, you know, those, uh, so they're finding, like, you know, those patients who don't have pancreatic cancer. Uh, but um, so they use those people who don't have a pancreatic cancer. And the exposure they had in mind was smoking status. So, but what happens is, like, you know, those people, uh, there may be other diseases that are actually related with smoking, like lung cancer. Even if that person has, like, you know, pancreatic cancer, they may have a lung cancer. So the the distribution of the exposure is going to be biased. And then it's actually going to be biased to the lung, meaning, like, you know, you're going to not find out, like, you know, whether there is actually a real association. So you have to be, like, you know, you have, so the, the based kind of design may be, like, when you have a registries, like for control, control studies, Unfortunately, in most developing countries, we don't have very, very good registries, like, you know, these registries for, even like, you know, for, if you look at contraceptive studies, there are a number of studies in Denmark and Sweden, because you, I don't know if you get struck, like, they actually have like, you know, data about contraceptive use of all women, like in Denmark, for example. So they can, uh, so, uh, 
because you already have like the captures almost enumerated the whole problem. You're not even taking a sample. So that actually is that. So I'm spending a little bit time to, because a lot of people design, like, you know, propose such kind of designs, but a lot more need, like, you know, needs to go into selecting the countries. Um, this is an example, like, uh, from uh, contraception is, let's say, using the same lark, does the history of exposure on family planning counseling in the prenatal period differ between women and the immediate postpartum period? Um, so what you're doing is, um, you're looking at, you're in the, like here is a postpartum period today. And you already know the status of LARC use at this point. Hopefully, you go back and the, 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 the OBJs at St. Paul or Gondar have actually done a good job, like, you know, recording uh, counseling in the antenatal care period. <laughs> and you go back and check um, about uh, antenatal care care, like counseling, whether like family planning counseling had happened. So this is just to say like, you know, I, I, like, you know, the data is as good as how we actually did it like in the first time. So if you already did not have that in the past, you, you're gonna have like, you know, bias with record. So if you just, if the way you actually are ascertaining exposure in this case, antenatal care, family planning, counseling, and you are asking the woman about their past, there may be a record bias. And it's possible, like, you know, those who haven't received it, they say, oh, no, I haven't heard about this. But though, like, so that's why you need to ascertain, like, you know, exposure in the past in a very relatively appropriate way. So I started going back again about this distinction between, like, you know, the prospective and prospective is cohort and uh, uh, retrospective is, um, case control by giving uh, like you know um, a counter example which is a nested case control study i mean even if like there's any a nested case control is actually if you broadly look at it it's actually the, the case control is actually um nested within a, um, um, a hypothetical cohort or even like an existing cohort what you're doing in the present is actually you're actually measuring the same way we're doing in the case control side, like, you know, uh, ascertaining outcomes, meaning cases and controls. So you take all the cases and you try and you take, instead of taking, they say, all controls, you actually take a sample of them. And what you do with that is you actually, your study base is going to be just this one, uh, the all cases and the sample of the controls. And then you go back again and ascertain. Uh, you go back in time and ascertain the predictors. Um, so you you see, like you know, the uh, why people find find it fascinating is, of course, because you're not measuring everything; you're actually reducing cost. So a classic example is if you have to do it for all of them, you and then you have like you know specimens caped, you have and then you have to do tests. It's going to be relatively expensive, but this is a relatively efficient study design. Uh, um, the last study type I will talk about is a cross-sectional study. Important thing is the assortment of, so we don't have like, you know, arrows like on the other ones. I mean, like, you know, even if the case control, we actually have arrows here, conceptually, we're going back in time. Here, it's actually happening at a point in time. At a point in time, maybe not just a day, it's maybe like a calendar year, but it's happening. So everything is actually measured at the same time, both exposures and outcomes, and then even um, other associated factors. And um, so uh, as you can see, it's actually relatively efficient. It's actually most of the design sites we actually have seen uh, being proposed uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, it's very good like you know, to get like you know, uh, baseline data for planning subsequent course study designs or even clinical trials. But the problem maybe is actually a causality. So you cannot make any causal statements up based on uh, cross-sectional studies because everything is happening at the same time. So there's no temporal relationship. Uh, so there will be like the egg and chicken dilemma here. So that is the most important thing. Exa an example maybe, uh, uh, you want to find like, you know, 
uh, if there is a differential uptake of LARC between urban and uh, rural women. So you actually go to um, one of the clinics in um, uh, Kigali, and then uh, you can you can see like the LARC uptake, and they actually have like you know uh, you can actually even ask them the same date when they have taken like the, um, um, the contraceptives and ascertain like whether they're coming from like an urban or rural area. So you can actually make such associations. Another example is fidelity of a standard counseling method, like you know, uh, if it increases LARC uptake. So it's actually happening on the same day. If you're doing that, you're measuring um, the, uh, the potential intervention and um, the outcome at the same time. Um, so this is a very good summary that I actually stole uh, from a lecture review from University of Washington. Um, uh, I will only highlight uh, some of the major design, uh, uh, strengths of designs. So validity is the most important thing because in the final criteria we said ethics and eth ethical means like you know you have to make sure it's uh, valid. So uh, to make valid like you know um, uh, <clears throat> statements and then avoid bias, risk of bias, this is actually the, the classic study design. Um, and you can actually have you're also another advantage is you can actually like measure multiple outcomes. That's it. Of course, yeah. study is um, relatively less expensive than the randomized trial. It's actually very useful for brain exposures. Very useful for brain exposures. Um, a cost control study, we talked about its efficiency in terms of um, uh, study, like, you know, you can have like a very, like, you know, very few number of um, uh, cases and you can actually make a very valid, as long as you actually have appropriate controls. Um, uh, and it's actually, this is maybe the only use, like, you know, the only feasible kind of approach for some of the real diseases. So if something is actually taking 25 years and you need 6,000 people, you're not going to do that. So you need to start with that. And this also, like, you know, for even a uh, short time, so even in epidemiology, like around CDC, uh, for new, like, you know, even for hypothesis, like, I have, uh, like, for quality, similar to qualitative studies, it's also is a very useful to develop hypothesis. So, like, you have a new outbreak happening, like, you know, CDC is usually does something like that. They're actually starting with their cases and they try to measure a number of predictors. Because in court study, you will have only looked at one exposure, so you'll not have that. Um, a cross-sectional study is the sufficiency. Like you know, but uh, but uh, all the limitation being the reverse causality, the egg and chicken dilemma, uh, and in case control studies, uh, the risk of uh, selection bias. If you don't like you know, no like you know, you're up, uh, if you're not selecting the correct um, controls, you're gonna have selection bias and a recall bias, um, especially with medications. It's actually very very common. Um, both randomized and cohort studies. I mean, like sometimes even you can consider randomized trials, as like, you know, prospective. Sometimes people are critically called prospective randomized trial. I mean, so they are relatively expensive. They take a long, long time. And there may be issues with ethics. Like, you know, you can't randomize falling from, a, you know, an airplane to see like, whether it's actually cases crisis. Because you've, you've seen the BMJ journal. <laughs> so, um, you can't randomize people to um, like uh, um, uh, toxic chemicals. So, <laughs> so environmental studies are not done like usually. Well, I cannot amendment to that kind of study. So, that is a brief overview. Thank you. All right. So, as you can see, there's a lot of options for research designs, um, and want to find the one that's going to match the research question that you're you're asking and once you've done those things and made sure that your power calculation is going to work for um, your research question then you're ready to write your research protocol and so this slide shows the general anatomy of what is going to go in your study plan so you're going to have your research question um, you're going to have a background and significance, and we'll talk a little bit more about all of these sections, but just to kind of give you the outline. Um, you're going to talk about the design, so the different components, as you can imagine, are going to be related to things that Brahana was just talking about. 
um, your subjects you'll be talking about, um, your variables, your predictors, your confounders, your outcome variables, and then your statistical approach um, to your study. So first of all, it's really important to make sure that you reviewed very carefully the sponsor's instructions. Um, there will often be specific instructions about how many uh, pages um, can be for this um, protocol, um, word limits, margins, fonts. There'll be instructions about what, what sections they want inside the protocol. We're going to give you some general sections, but it's often different depending on what sponsor. Um, they may uh, have limitations on number of references or, um, you know, different things. They may want letters of recommendation. Um, they may want a letter from your chairman. They might want documentation of different things. So really important to look carefully at what the sponsor instructions are to make sure that you have everything um, so that you have the strongest application possible. The first thing in the research protocol is usually the abstract. Um, although this is the first thing that you see in the first page of the protocol, I usually recommend that you write this last because this will change as you develop your protocol. So this um, really should be the last thing that you write so that it is the strongest and most representative of the final version of your protocol. This is a summary of the protocol. It's one paragraph. Um, it should include background. And by background, I mean two sentences, um, one that pretty much comments on the importance of the protocol and one on the gap that you're going to be addressing. So really a very, very short background. Um, you should have your objectives of the protocol in there and then a summary of the design so that a person who's going to be reading the protocol can look at this and get excited about what they're going to read. And they have a, a very clear, abbreviated um, message about what they're going to be seeing and be excited about it. So you want to write this last, and this is the first thing people are going to see, and you want to really, um, you know, you want to hit it out of the park with this abstract. And you're going to be tired because it's the last thing that you're doing, but this is really what people see first, and so you really want to make a great impression with the abstract. Um, the next thing is going to be the research question, and this is often in the form of a page of specific aims and hypotheses. Usually there's a paragraph first that kind of introduces everything and it's an opportunity to put your rationale for your, um, your protocol together. Um, so you put a little bit, just a little bit of background to, to give the rationale to, to state one overall overarching writing goal for your protocol. Um, and then your specific aims also, which can also be called objectives, um, should be stated. And I usually say no more than three for a large study, and then really one to two for a pilot study is perfectly reasonable. Um, and then usually under each of the specific aims to put your hypothesis. So specific aim, then the hypothesis underneath, specific aim, then the hypothesis underneath, it all really organized um, both for yourself and for the reader to be able to follow along at what you are planning. The next section is your background and significance. Um, so this section should be written after you've done all of your background work and you've finessed your research question. Don't try to write this early. Um, because this is going to change as you get your research question really drilled down. Um, so you don't want to start this section early. This should be like one or two pages. Um, I usually say that you don't need any separate literature review, just a background and significance is all you're going to need. Um, and you really want this section to be focused to your research question. Um, so. You want to be very specific. You want to build the story of why your protocol and your research question is important. So you want to talk about what is known about this specific area that you are going to be studying um, and then where the gap is. You want, so you want to kind of, you know, you're building a story 
This is what we know about this specific research area. These are the references. This is where the gap of knowledge is. And this is how my study is going to address it. And then impact. By addressing it, I'm going to advance the field in the following way. And then can even put in like what this would lead to next. If I find this, then I am going to you know, come up with an intervention to address it as my next area of research. Um, so you really want to be very focused on the research question and really show where that gap of knowledge is and how you're going to make an impact. <coughs> and again, this could be about one to two pages. The next section is your research design. Um, this is also called the approach section in NIH grants, but basically this is your research design. Um, I usually tell people that a diagram is always helpful to, so that people can follow along and clearly understand what you're doing. It's not required, but it's, it's helpful. Um, it's good to include a brief justica justification for the study design that you've chosen. Um, you are going to provide information about your subjects. We'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and then you're going to put all the details about the design that you've chosen and how you're going to be carrying it out. Um, if you have a design that's going to have controls, you're going to be talking about your subjects, your controls. If there's any visits involved, you're going to be talking about when they're going to occur, how many there are, what's going to happen at each of them, who is going to be approaching the, the subjects, what measurements they're going to have done, how often those are going to be done, what's going to be collected, where things are going to be stored, um, what's going to be measured, how they're going to be measured, um, what's going to be the outcome, exposure, associated factors. Um, if you have surveys or questionnaires, uh, and they're already developed, you can put copies of those in the appendix. Um, you're going to, uh, if those surveys or questionnaires are things that are already standardized questionnaires, you're going to want to have the references for those. Um, if you are doing study group discussions, I uh, mean, excuse me, focus group discussions, then you're going to want to have information on um, how many people are going to be in the focus groups, um, where you're going to how you're going to distribute the type of people that are going to be in there. Are they going to be patients? Are they going to be administrators from the hospital? Are you going to mix them together? Um, what kind of questions you're going to be asking them? You know, you're really going to try to put all of the details of the design that are going to, that are necessary to carry out the research design that you have chosen to answer your research question. All of those details are going to go in here. For the study subjects, you want to include specifically information about recruitment, how you're going to recruit them, and where you're going to recruit them from. So is this a hospital-based recruitment? Are you going to be recruiting from multiple sites? Are there multiple health facilities you're recruiting from? Is it a community-based recruitment? Are you um, recruiting from, uh, you know, are you going to be using a, um, um, putting announcements in newspapers and recruiting from, you know, people, um, you know, how exactly you're doing your recruitment. Um, feasibility is always great to try to address in here. So if, if you have found in your sample size that you need to recruit 500 women, then if you can put information saying that we see, you know, 200 women a month in our facility with this problem, you know, you can show that it's feasible for you to be able to recruit that number of individuals. Um, so if you have any information that you can put in there that shows that this is likely to be able to be feasible to be able to recruit the number of people that you're saying you're going to recruit, it's great to be able to get that in there um, to help convince the readers that you'll be able to carry out the, the project. Um, inclusion criteria. So the, the age of the women, um, if there's any you know, language issues. Um, let's say you're doing a study on um, second trimester abortion and one of your outcomes is going to be anemia. Maybe you're going to have an exclusion criteria that they, you're, you're going to exclude people who have anemia when they come in because your outcome is anemia, so you're not going to include people who have anemia. 
Um, so you really want to define what your inclusion and your exclusion criteria, and maybe you're going to translate your um, consent into two or three languages, but you're going to have to exclude women who speak other languages. Um, really want to define out what those inclusion and exclusion criteria will be. And then um, screening, if there's going to be any particular intervention, what kind of screening you're going to do. Um, is there going to be any, they have, they have to have any specific health status um, in order to be in the study. Um, if you're doing a randomized controlled trial, which I realized that there, that's a, um, a design that's for more advanced research, um, you will have to put in your randomization plan, such as um, randomized uh, numbers from a computer versus um, blinded envelopes or, you know, other um, randomization plans. Now we're going to talk about measurement. Thank you very much, uh, Yolanda. So, um, I'm not going to be spending a lot of time, so we'll um, probably over the next three, four minutes, um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the most important part of, like, you know, the, st the, the study plan. Um, I say jokingly because, I mean, like, at the end of the day, like, you know, this, like, you know, we're saying everything is important, like, you know, the, the research question is important, the design is important. But at the end of the day, like, you know, you're going to measure um, variables, and that's actually what you're going to be publishing, and then that actually makes you even get more funding, right, for the next uh, grant. So you have to, like, you know, um, all of the, the designs have to lead into, like, you know, appropriate measurement. So, um, <clears throat> As Dr. Yolanda was mentioning, so the, the, we can call them like you know there are also called uh, these measurements are called variables, and broadly we can actually classify them into outcome, projector, and compounding variables. And uh, because we don't have all the money in the world again, uh, we have to be uh, very conscious on um, at least measuring what we need. I mean it's uh, and. Because the, there is actually a reason for why we need to do that, those measurements, uh, even if you're interested about like the outcome variables, because of the risk of um, bias we talked about, like the risk of compounding we talked about. Um, so uh, I would like to do a couple of minutes here in analytical studies, so like separate from descriptive studies where we're measuring a factor, like, you know, a parameter, like, say, it's a prevalence or an incidence, what we're trying to do is we're investigating this question, this hypothesis that Yolanda was talking about, so the hypothesis that there is an association between an intervention and an outcome, an intervention and a disease. But as we know, as we talked about earlier, there may be other factors that are both associated with like, you know, the exposure and the outcome, and we call them confounders. So we need, like, you know, the reason we're actually collecting more than this because it is, it's possible that, you know, the distribution of the exposure may be different, uh, the, the, like, you know, between the two groups, not because of that specific factor. For example, let's say um, we're looking at the association of uh, oral contraceptive use, and let's say or, um, endometrial cancer. There may be other factors that are associated with selecting to use a specific contraceptive <coughs> method and endometrial cancer. Unless we are, we are actually accounting for those differences, if there are, like, you know, if the prevalence of that third factor called confounder is, not, is very different between the two groups, then we're going to have, like, you know, uh, like an invited conclusion. So that's why. We need to measure as like as many variables as possible. That are actually associated. If if it is only associated with exposure and not out, that may not be relevant. You have a question in the chat, Dr. Bahane. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh, uh, I have to. Why why don't you take it? Maybe maybe you can read it. Uh, the question from oh. Fant from Fontaine is, it is common to include literature review as a separate section in research protocols. However, in your presentation, it said no need to have a separate section. So when do we include it? 
Um, I, I would say that if the sponsor requests a separate literature review, then I would put it in. I personally don't request a separate literature review on any protocols that, that I ask for. Thank you. And so going back, so we're actually trying to look at um, this different. So from all of this, what do you think is the most important thing? Let me know. So, the outcome, because it's, because it's part of the picot. Uh, not because of that, but it's because the outcome is actually the one that actually drives uh, the analysis that we will talk about later on. So um, there has to be like a very important, like, you know, a very good consideration about um, like, you know, valid measurements, like standardized measurements that have to be done. The same actually could go also with um, the exposure and the confounders. Um, So the next, like, classic, um, this is just the la this is actually my last uh, slide. So I like you know the statistical, statistical analysis plan. I should have said statistical analysis plan is actually one of the most important, like you know one. <laughs> <laughs> the most important. Right? <laughs> the, one of the important uh, sections. But I forgot, like I wanted to, the most important statement I should have made at the top. Can you guess what that is? It's actually work with a biostatistician. Probably that is the most important advice I would give than like all the, the other stuff is actually very small point, honestly. Um, uh, as we, like, you know, even if like, you know, I, I believe like, you know, in instructor training, I mean like, you know, there are a lot of considerations that you have not thought about that like, you know, that a statistician may have thought about. So, and I will also say, you should consult, like, you know, work with them from the start. Before you start, because they're going to help you with calculation of your sample size and the kind of statistical analysis. You're, this is a major, like, once you actually start, like, collecting data, it is not going to be useful. I, we talked about the last time, like, you know, whatever, like, this is, you're in the design phase, so you should uh, consult uh, um, the, stat, the statistician. Uh, and uh, so the base statistical analysis are stated for each specific hypothesis. As Dr. Randa was saying, you have a specific aim, hypothesis, and then for that specific hypothesis, you need to have a specific analysis plan. Sometimes you feel like, you know, oh, there are similar analysis plan. Like, you know, it's both better, like, you know, to actually um, uh, uh, state them. Uh, and then the other, like, you know, these are general considerations. The other consideration I'll make is like, um, uh, uh, we have to tailor, like again, to the specific uh, specific aims, um, because uh, Dr. Rolanda gave you a pearl slide. I don't know if you have found it. One of the pearl slides about, you know, how there, like you know, once you have like you know a well-designed uh, question, then you have to make it, uh, like you know you have to work with your statistician to calculate your sample, like you know your sample size, whether it's actually feasible. So this is a section that you're actually. Uh, uh, we devote into. So statistical analysis and sample size are actually related in such a way that, you know, it's actually just the kind of analysis that determines the kind of formula you'll be using. I will spend a minute talking about different outcomes. So it's, it's actually driven by the outcome. So I can divide, like, you know, outcomes as continuous uh, and categorical and then categorical and binary. So for continuous outcomes, you usually like you know for descriptive purposes, you actually summarize them through means, standard deviations, medians, or interquartiles. You summarize like binary outcomes, like you know, use, using LARC, no no use of LARC, died, alive, such kind of um, like you know to so for those we summarize like you know uh, the proportion like you know proportions as proportions and when we try to compare, we use like chi square tests. Uh, and then for continuous one, like, you know, we use, like, you know, if it's two sample tests, we use two, two tests. And uh, so I'm, I'm just mentioning this just to give you the direction that, you know, the way you, you, to, you can actually think about statistical analysis when you start with outcomes. So if you start with outcomes uh, and then, like, you know, um, the linear regression, the logistic regression, the, like, survival analysis for time to event would actually make sense. So that's where, why we're actually believing on... Um, 
uh, like you know, paying too much, like a very careful attention to the outcome you're looking at. Um, so again, the best advice I can give is work with your mentor and have a bar session for this section. Thank you. And then some additional items that are um, common in a research protocol. One of them is a timeline. Um, so this, you want to make sure if it's a timeline that the research sponsor gives for this research um, that they're going to be funding. This will include things like getting IRB approval, um, you know, doing the startup for the project, doing the recruitment, carrying out um, all of the visits, um, cleaning the data, doing the analysis, um, writing the manuscript publication, all of those things you would put in your timeline. Um, then there's uh, something that you can put in your research protocols, not always required, but if you have room in there, um, putting something about limitations and alternative plans. So, you know, there's always there's always weaknesses in every protocol, and looking in yours and trying to identify where that might be, and then providing some alternative plans shows that you've identified them and that you've come up with solutions in case you have problems, and that also gives the reviewer of the grant more confidence in your ability to carry it out. So for example, let's say you have a really high sample size that you need. Let's say you've done your calculation to carry it out, you need to recruit you know, 500 women, and that really looks like a large sample size to, um, to recruit in a short time period. Um, and perhaps um, you, know, you recognize that that might be a little bit tight. Um, you think you can do it, but you think that's a little bit tight, and the reviewer may as well. Um, you may go and talk to one of your research colleagues at another institution and say, um, look, if I find that um, in the first four months I am behind on recruitment, um, would you be willing to um, join this research study and put in an IRB and do recruitment at your site and um, help me with this project? And that person says, yes, I'd be willing to do it. And you can go and add in, in this limitations and alternative plans that you recognize that the recruitment um, that is, um, you know, aggressive, and um, if you find that in the first four months you're behind on recruitment, you have identified this investigator at this institution, and he has agreed to be an alternative site to do additional recruitment, and he had he sees 300 patients a month with the same problem and will assist with recruitment. You know, so you have an opportunity to put things in there that show that you've identified areas that could be weaknesses. You're on top of it. You have an alternative plan. So um, you can, um, you know, you can save a little bit of space in your research protocol, put those things in, and that can be helpful to show your thoughtfulness and your advanced planning. And then, um, of course, you're going to have your references, and that will not count towards your page limit um, for your research protocol. Um, and then um, just you know a few last things we've, which we've said over and over again, um, just to keep everything focused on your well-developed research question. Um, you just want to be convincing the reader of the um, importance of the gap in knowledge that you are going to be addressing with your important question and with your important research. Um, and you want to have your design and your analysis closely aligned with your stated question, and then you're going to have a fantastic research protocol and um, accomplish great research things. Thank you for joining us today. We're glad to take any questions. Hi, I'm Mangusto from Bacala University. I have uh, two questions. The first one is, uh, uh, can we use uh, research protocol and uh, uh, research proposal interchangeably, or is there any any difference while using protocol and proposal? And my second question is, uh, actually, uh, doubt. You, you have said uh, cohort differs from experimental uh, by the absence of our randomization. And uh, I, I, I have worry on that because uh, in cohort it's totally in uh, it is observation, so you don't have mandate to manipulate the the intervention. Uh, so it is more than that, uh, as to me. Uh, 
and uh, um, probably this is common. And the third one is a retrospective cohort, uh, where there is no time dimension and uh, interval measurement. You know, students um, uh, or even uh, our faculties, uh, they have confusion with uh, case control because they start with a condition and uh, uh, go back to see the exposures. So if there is no time dimension and uh, uh, measurements at interval, it could be regular or irregular. Uh, so in a hand, it is very difficult to have the same measurement or similar measurement at interval. Uh, even uh, when you have um, birth outcome, to see the exposure during antenatal care, it's very difficult. The measurement varies. So unless it is designed in a similar in a similar way, uh, retrospective in a hands is uh, very difficult. Can you mention retrospective um, cohort studies, if any, if you have uh, example? To understand, uh, you know, more. Otherwise, uh, we confuse case control with retrospective. Uh, anyway, thank you for the all the presenters. We, we, you have clarified our confusion. Uh, it was very organized. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, these are actually very, um, very important uh, questions that you raised. So I'll start with the simple one. So the difference between research proposal versus research protocol. Sometimes it feels like it seems like semantics, uh, meaning like you know, they're actually similar. But um, uh, by by definition, though, like a protocol actually has details. Sometimes some people actually use even like you know, standard operating procedures. Um, uh, I mean, but basically, proposal means like you know something you're actually. Because there may be like a request for proposal, like you know, to actually um, uh, uh, based on a criteria, like you know, that um, a funder or um, uh, a sponsor has done, uh, you're actually trying to write something to that. So that's actually why. But I, I think, like, I actually really like the term protocol for this kind of studies because it's uh, it's actually is really tied with the study design and the selection. So protocol means like you know, it's very standard. It's very explicit. Sometimes even protocols can actually be really long. I'm sure, like you know, if you've seen, I don't know what is called the IHC, like you know, for um, like uh, the harmonized for clinical trials, like you know, it's page and page of documentations. Because I think, like like Dr. Riolanda was mentioning, even for how you're gonna be selecting, uh, like you know, even for c control uh, randomized control trials, you have to be very explicit on how you're defining randomization if you're doing blinding. Uh, so, and uh, how, uh, what kind of randomization you're using, like, you know, was it um, uh, like broke bro randomization? So, so it has a lot of details and it also may include the, the survey instruments. So it's relatively detailed. Uh, but sometimes people actually use them interchangeably. It may be also a culture thing, I think. Yeah, and protocol, I think we also use, like we also include details in there about like who has what role, um, what the research associate's gonna do, um, you know, like what, um, you know, what are the, what documents, what research documents have to be signed, who have to be signed by, like protocol has some other implications. We're, we're talking about, um, Proposal more in terms of like grant application, I guess. But I could see how they sound and seem very similar, and I think it's just the way we talk about it. I think in Ethiopia, most people use proposal. I haven't seen like you no know, protocol most of the time, like you know, whenever there. So that's fine. Uh, the other important thing you actually mentioned is um, um, so for this specific like you no know, presentation, uh, thought, uh, I mean, we can do like an hours long about each of the specific study designs. I'm just, like, you know, you're absolutely right. So the difference between, like, you know, we're starting, I always like to think, starting from a randomized control trial, specifically even 
not the typical randomized trial, but the idealized randomized control trial where you don't have like, you know, lots to follow up. So just to take uh, conceptually think. So you write, what is the difference is you're manipul like whether you're actually manipulating intervention or exposure. Uh, ran but uh, randomization is one way to assure, like, you know, uh, you're right. Randomization is not, uh, like, a, um, is a strategy you use to assure validity. Uh, but the major thing is, like, you know, I, I agree, like it is actually um, um, a slip. The, the, it's not the randomization, but the manipulation, like we said. That's actually why the difference starts. Observational versus experimental is the random, like the, not the randomization, but the manipulation of um, exposure or intervention. I, 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 I agree. Um, but not randomization is not the only thing. So, um, the other important thing, yes, there is a lot of confusion. You're right, rich perspective court study designs and case control st st study designs. That's why I say like case control study designs are really hard. And most of the, from my experience, Yolanda can speak uh, also from your experience, to be able to do like, you know, very, like a very good retrospective court designs, you need to have had like, you know, continuous, like there, there has to be the, the time element is a, a very important thing. Like it's a court. When we say court, like from the Roman, it's actually comes from the Roman term for uh, soldiers, like working together. So you have you have to clearly define uh, based like you know, some demographic. It's not only demographics, certain features at the outset, whether it is happened like you know, it's a hypothetical one or a real one. It has to happen, like you know. And because we like you know there is this biomedical approach saying that you know you need time for disease to develop. So that's why that there is a time element. So there was this time element where the people were not exposed. So when you even for both case control studies and uh, court studies, you have to make sure that those people hypothetically should have been at risk, but they should not have the disease to start with. They were at risk to develop. Like you can't study about endometrial cancer for women who have like, you know, their uterus, uterus removed, right? So I have to be like, uh, so, after ascertaining that, you have to follow them over time. So how you follow them over time? If you have um, a clearly defined thing, like through your database, like a classic example I mentioned is registries. Registries or claims databases, or electronic data records, that's where you're actually uh, going to get a lot of the measurements. You're right? Oh, yeah. Oh, Dr. Berhano, you have several questions in the chat from our colleague at University for One. Okay. Um, so there is actually some like uh, the 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 usual examples are like you know you're right that the, the the difficulty is you have to ascertain that the 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 controls you have would have been included if they developed the case, but usually we miss them. So that's actually why I gave the, the example of um, hospital hospital uh, based controls, and that's actually what we see in most of the proposals, or even even if it is a community, even if it's a community based, some people think like you know community based controls are relatively free of life bias, but it's not possible because, for example, if you are at McAlee, McAlee is a referral hospital. What is the catchment area for McAlee? If it is for a common illness like common cold. People are coming from nearby versus how about those come, people coming from like, you know, 500 kilometers away. So they're going to be different in other factors. So uh, I would just say to like, you know, it's difficult, but I will um, gladly like, you know, want to like, you know, give you more like, you know, references or uh, like, you know, aside, because if you have other questions, uh, I would like to address uh, uh, them. Yeah. Next question. There are several questions for you in the chat. Oh. From our colleague from University of Rome. Oh, I'm sorry, from, from GEMA. Thank you. <laughs> okay, how can you balance between power and feasibility issue? I'm going to pass this uh, to you. Um, yeah, so um, that you have to make sure that you're choosing a research question that allows you to that that you can act that you can answer, um, which is why you're looking at the power early um, to make sure that it is that it is feasible. Um, 
that I mean that's just one of the things that you have to consider in in your study because you are going to be your study is going to be assessed on whether it's feasible. If you have a study that has a very very large sample size and it does not look like it's going to be feasible in the time frame or um, in the recruitment goal, people are going to say it is over ambitious. That is like a deadly term to have in your review. Um, so you're going to have to look back and say, okay, um, can I narrow down my research? Can I, you know, readjust my research question um, to make, you know, to hone it down, change it around to make sure that my that it becomes something that's feasible to do. Um, so that is something that, if you see that it's out of balance, then you have to go back and look at your research question, or you have to look at your power analysis and make sure that your power analysis was really, you know, appropriate, that you that you have all the right numbers in there with it. I think in the next question is on uh, for me, <coughs> which was, why ethical issues is not a case in a court studies? <laughs> you guys have been like very, like, you know, like, you know, very good. Like, you know, this is actually, so ethics is actually an issue in every kind of study. I mean, like, that's actually why every study, even including cross-sectional study, requires an ethics statement. Yes. We should have included that. I granted so that's actually on our oversight. And hopefully, we also, hopefully, at some point, we also do a webinar on research ethics. So it's important. But when we say, it, like, you know, when we're looking at differences, ethical, because, of, because randomization is not happening or manipulation is not happening by the intervention, so you're not doing, like, you know, harm. So we're not randomizing people to smoke <coughs> to get exposed. That's what we make. But uh, every every uh, uh, that's why we have an IRB. IRB has to make sure, like you know, they are actually protecting the research participants. And the next one was okay, about RTTs. You said, how can we avoid confounders in uh, RT studies? You write, like you know, the reason. We have, um, we're, actually, we're starting with randomized control trials is because the risk of compounding is very less. Um, I mean, usually, um, so, so randomized control trials actually go back to, and, you know, to the, 90, the early 90s and 1900s. And randomization, like it was a, one of the biggest uh, discoveries in, uh, in the field of statistics, like, you know, and helping like in clinical trials. It actually assures as much as possible, like, you know, the, the, the distribution of factors to be equalized. But there are instances definitely where you, this, like, you know, the balancing of uh, potential confounders is not happening. That's why sometimes you can actually, um, uh, although it's not usually, really, like, you know, uh, usually in the analytic phase, people can also adjust for confounders. But you have to be careful. Sometimes you can actually adjust, like, you know, um, too much, and then like you know lose. So you have to be very careful. It's really for small sample size studies. You'd have to do something like that. Yeah, I'm just in terms of the. Um, there's a question about how many research questions you can, um, how many specific aims you can have for your. Uh, for your study, and I'm just saying, well, I said three is usually um, a good number, and um, for larger studies, and that's a general recommendation that we give for NI, even for NIH R01 NIH grants, which are so I think that that's a good um, guideline. People may feel that they have an extra aim that they want to put in there, and I'm not saying that that can't do that, but even for NIH grants, you will rarely see a seasoned senior investigator ever put more than three specific aims in. The other question says, if the difference between RCT and cohort is randomization, can we say cohort and cause experiments as society are just uh, are the same? This is actually similar to what uh, 
uh, Mangisto was actually mentioning. Um, um, Yolanda and I don't like uh, the, the, the term quasi-experimental. <laughs> so, like, you're right, quasi-experimental means, like, you know, if there are, like, you know, natural events that are already happening, especially this is, like, ecologically. Like, uh, um, uh, but uh, the distinction is not so much, uh, so, like we said, it's not about randomization, it's about manipulation of exposure. And ex in a uh, quasi-experimental thing, uh, manipulation is happening, but it's not the investigator. So, a classic example people give is like, you know, what is it, uh, uh, a lightning. I mean, like, I'm not bringing the, like, the, but the lightning is happening in certain areas and not certain other areas, like, that's actually happening. Uh, I mean, um, as long as you are actually accounting for the other, like, you know, um, if you're assuming the two populations where lightning is happening are very similar, then you can, like, consider it as an experimental design. But, I worry, like, you know, there may be other factors there that may be yeah. completely different between the two groups. Yeah, I don't think we, I, I don't think we can say that they are the same. Yeah. I think they're different. <coughs> Is there any means of analyzing causality with structural equation models in cross-sectional studies? Is there any means of analyzing causality? Yeah. So, this is actually, even if uh, structural equation models are like very fancy things and uh, I probably have just learned them and have never used them, so I'll be very honest. But I, this is a very simple question. So, even if, by design, cross-sectional studies, very impossible to talk about causality because you can't ascertain temporality. Tempora so, there is a Bradford Hill kind of criteria for causality. It's a criteria. And I'm actually always very careful about criteria. I mean, these are guides. Like, you know, one is like, you know, biological plausibility, temporality, uh, those response relationship. Of all these things, everyone, like, you know, this may not work, but the consistent thing is temporality. Temporality is very essential. You have to assure that, you know, one thing is happening after that. This is philosophy. Like, you know, this is actually a philosophical idea. So something is happening before. So. Even if you're using any statistical models, I don't think you'll be able to, like, you know, answer, like, you know, the, the causality issues uh, the cross-sectional study design. If you're measuring exposure in a lot of time, very difficult. Like, uh, I, by design, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Other questions? It looks like, like yeah. yeah. In the chat. But when this too, like, you know, I'll be, yeah, you raised a very important thing. We didn't have enough time, honestly. Like, uh, but uh, I will make sure, like you know, I will communicate with you and give you, like you know, we can have more discussions. Of the record, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much for attending and great questions. Thank you for all the participation. Really appreciate it.